Attitude Magazine's ADHD Expert Series. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, today's program is brought to you by Forebrain. Forebrain is an award-winning audio device that enhances attention, memory, language, and processing. As a leader in the field of educational technology, Forebrain continues to develop ways to enhance sensory and language processing. For more information, please visit Forebrain on the web, www.forebrain.com. Uh, we're so pleased today to welcome Sharon Heller, PhD, to discuss sensory processing disorder in adults. Let me underscore that. This is a, a webinar on SPD, sensory processing disorder in adults, not in children. Um, Dr. Heller will describe how to identify sensory processing disorder, how to distinguish it from ADHD, and what to do when both conditions coexist. Uh, Sharon Heller is a developmental psychologist who specializes in holistic solutions for adults with anxiety, panic, and sensory processing disorders. She received her master's degree from the University of Chicago and a PhD from Loyola, Loyola University of Chicago and is the author of several popular books, including Too Loud, Too Bright, Too Fast, Too Tight, What to Do if You're Sensory Defensive in an Overstimulating World. For more information, please visit her website, SharonHeller.net. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Dr. Heller. We're so grateful for your time. Um, before Hi. Dr. Heller be <laughs> Hi. Thanks. Just let me, a few words about the presentation uh, just before Dr. Heller starts her presentation. Welcome to all of you. You are muted, so please post your questions for Dr. Heller in the box on your screen. After she presents her slides, she'll respond to as many questions as we have time for. If you have audio problems, please dial in via your phone line. Um, after our session, you'll find a summary of Dr. Heller's slides as well as the replay of this webinar on the Attitude website, attitudemag.com slash webinars, and a podcast version for download for listening wherever convenient will be available in the iTunes store in the ADHD Experts audio series. And if you listen to our, uh, our podcasts and view our webinars on demand, we would love you to give us a shout out via a review on iTunes. So with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Heller to begin her presentation with our thanks again for being here today. Hello. Hi. You may start your slides, Dr. Heller. Okay. So I want to uh, welcome everyone who's listening. And I, I want to mention that we just um, had a very interesting thing happen, which is a big computer glitch. <laughs> we had panic the last 10 minutes, and I'm speaking on my cell phone. So my organization and attention is challenged, but I am going to do my very best <laughs> to do very well. So let's begin. Okay, so the, the first slide is the definition of sensory processing disorder. Uh, it's a common but relatively unknown condition in which sensory messages get scrambled in the brain causing a traffic jam on the sensory highway, and you cannot make sense of or respond appropriately to the world. Of course, that's a lot of jargon, so what actually is it? And I think that psychologist Stanley Greenspan does a better job in describing it. Imagine driving a car that isn't working well. When you step on the gas, the car sometimes lurches forward and sometimes doesn't respond. When you blow the horn, it sounds blaring. The brakes sometimes slow the car, but not always. The blinkers work occasionally. The steering is erratic, and the speedometer is inaccurate. You are engaged in a constant struggle to keep the ear on the road, and it is difficult to concentrate on anything else. So I hope that gives you a better idea about sensory processing disorder, which I'm going to now call SPD. So what are the signs? First of all, oversensitivity to sensation, which is the one that most people really associate with SPD. Um, so you cringe when someone touches your shoulder. But you also can be undersensitive to sensation, and you don't feel the ant crawling up your arm. Coordination problems, you're clumsy, you have two left feet, you're an underachiever, poor attention, poorly organized behavior, poor self-concept, emotional instability. And other areas of, uh, Stuart, I'm sorry, next slide. Other areas of potential problems are poor posture, faulty visual processing, faulty hearing and language processing, 
allergies and compromised immune system and psychiatric disorders. And we're going to go heavily into the various different psychiatric disorders associated with SPD. So as you can all already see from the get-go, there's a lot of overlap between SPD and ADHD. Both experience poor attention or the poorly organized, poorly organized behavior and emotional instability. As I talk further, you will see that those with SPD can also display hyperactivity and impulsive behavior. But before I go into further details, let me spend a bit more time on explaining SPD. Let's talk about the subtypes. Sensory processing disorder gets played out in different ways, and no two people experience it the same way. First, you have sensory modulation disorder. Those who suffer sensory modulation disorder lack the ability to turn up or turn down volume of sensory input and to focus in on and respond appropriately to relevant sensation. This varies from your brain barely registering sen sensation, for instance, not hearing the phone ring, to feeling overwhelmed by slight sensation and you startle when the phone rings. In other words, you can be hypo-responsive or hyper-responsive to sensation. Okay, uh, next slide, the chart. Okay, you have four different categories of sensory modulation disorder. I want you to look on the left and you see energy level. You see low and high, and then on top, sensory threshold, low and high. So now look under avoider, which uh, um, high sensitivity over responsive to the first one, which is the shy person, and you have, you're, you're an avoider, um, and you have a low energy level, and passive self-regulation. You feel fearful and anxious, quiet and introverted, cautious and wary, compliant, socially phobic, dependent, rigid, and overly serious. Now go down to the avoider who has a high energy level, and this is a feisty person who uses active self-regulation. And this person is difficult, willful, angry, explosive, defiant, rude, edgy, impulsive, fussy, height, rigid, intense and serious, but very aware. And actually, the uh, shy person is also aware. Okay, now go over to the right side where you see seekers who have low sensitivity and under-responsiveness. Now, the seeker who has low energy is called the languid or the cautious person, and they have passive self-regulation. This person is seems disinterested, bored, oblivious. They get easily fatigued. They're sedentary. They have low muscle tone. Uh, they're lethargic. People call them lazy. They're shy, withdrawn, and depressed. They're unstructured, undisciplined, unaware. Uh, they're the dreamer. Sometimes they're, they're called the indigo child. They're the couch or the mouse potato. And, you know, keep in mind that not everybody who fits in these categories has all these characteristics. Okay, now go down to the seeker who has a high energy level. And this person is bold and reckless, and they use active self-regulation. This is your extrovert, your risk taker, thrill seeker, your impulsive person, your hyperactive manic person. Uh, your uninhibited and sensitive, bored, distractive, and undisciplined person who is in your face, so you know who this person is. <clears throat> okay, now, next we have sensory discrimination disorder. And those who suffer sensory discrimination disorder find it difficult to distinguish one sensation from another. The taste of lemon from lime, the sound of a cat's meow from a bird chirp, your thigh or your knee being touched, and this makes it difficult to accurately assess information and causes much confusion, frustration, and anxiety. Next, we have sensory-based motor disorder. And those who suffer this disorder have difficulty navigating through space, and they're clumsy, uncoordinated, and often gravitationally insecure. That means they over-respond to position changes and are fearful. So for instance, if when you lose your balance, if that makes you afraid, you may be gravitationally insecure. 
Uh, also, there might be fine motor problems and you have a sloppy handwriting. And by the way, if anyone has a sloppy handwriting, that's a red flag for sensory processing disorder. Now, um, sensory modulation, modulation disorder may exist independently of the other two, while sensory discrimination disorder generally coexists with motor and modulation problems. And motor problems generally coexist with both discrimination and modulation problems. So you see there's a, a, a wide variety of actually what it means to have sensory processing disorder. Some people experience only modulation problems. Some, peer, some people experience problems with all three subtypes. So now that you have a general idea about SPD, let's look again at how it's similar to ADHD. So with both, you can be distracted, impulsive, hyperactive, disorganized, anxious, have social difficulties, and depression. So you see there's much overlap. So now you might be asking yourself, so if, if sensory processing problems cause you to be inattentive and hyperactive, how do they dif differ from ADHD? And this is a hotly debated question. However, researcher and OT Lucy Miller has identified ways to distinguish ADHD from SPD. So here are the differences that she identifies. You cannot stop impulsive behavior regardless of sensory input. You crave novelty and activity that is not necessarily related to specific sensations. You do not become more organized after receiving intense sensory input. You have difficulty waiting or taking turns. Wait or, ta or take turns, but you wait or take turns better with cognitive than sensory input. You tend to talk all the time, impulsively interrupting, and you have trouble waiting for your turn in any conversation. Also, very important, stimulating meds like Ritalin work with ADHD, but not with SPD. Okay, so, so do you have ADHD or SPD or both? And actually, Lucy Miller found around 50 to 70% have both. For instance, ADHD children commonly demonstrate aggression, sensation seeking, and tactile sensitivity, suggesting sensory modulation difficult, difficulties, as well as clumsiness, dyspraxia, sensitivity to movement, which is poor vestibular processing, and best, we didn't go into the vestibular system, but that's your balance system, and I'm going to use that word a few more times. Um, and these children become easily dizzy. But it's also possible that in some cases, ADHD is mimicking SPD and is mistaken for this SPD, so you're misdiagnosed. So here are some ways in which ADHD is mistaken for SPD. Noise. If noise distracts you, it's hard to concentrate and focus on what you're reading. Scene. If your brain scrambles what you see, and you will if you have visual processing problems, you may ignore or have difficulty following written instructions and you seem distracted. Hearing. If your brain scram scrambles what you hear, and you will if you have auditory processing problems, you may ignore or have difficulty following verbal instructions and you seem distracted. Sensory defensiveness. If you are bothered by the tags in your shirt or when you were a child, other children sitting too close to you, you will squirm, wiggle, or jump about and appear hyperactive. If you are auditory defensive, noise makes it hard to concentrate and, and focus. If you are visually defensive, hypersensitivity to light, patterns, and movement makes it hard to focus. Overstimulation. If, let's say, your work environment overwhelms you with people too close, constant chatter, buzzing fluorescent lights, intense colors, and cold air conditioning, your mind will be in a fog and finding it hard to make sense of what you see, hear, or feel, you appear spacey. Sensation seeking. If you are a sensation seeker, you get too easily bored to focus on anything but the next buzz and you might appear hyperactive and distracted. And this is because your cortex lacks sufficient dopamine to engage in the world and you seek activity to boost it. And by the way, 
it is what Ritalin does is boost dopamine. Okay, hyper-responsivity. If you are hyper-responsive to sensation, you tune out to, uh, to your world easily and you may not pay attention and you appear unfocused and out of it and you also have poor memory. So as you see, discerning whether you have SPD or only ADD or both uh, can be complicated, but it's crucial to figure out the difference because the treatments differ. You know, for instance, um, if you're distracted and have hyperactivity from SPD, taking the psychostimulant Ritalin has no effect because it does not have any effect on SPD. And, and if you do take it, it will delay your progress as the sensory issues that underlie the behavior will persist. But before we talk about treatment, I want to talk about another issue that SPD and ADHD have in common, and that's psychiatric disorders. I want to go through the many ways that SPD creates mimics or contributes to psychopathology, as I believe many of you listening will resonate with this information. Okay, so first we'll, let's look at psychopathology and sensory defensiveness. Under anxiety, you have generalized anxiety disorder. Okay, so overwhelmed, hyped, and stressed from sensory overload, you experience constant muscle tension, fidgeting and restlessness, irritability, and often angry outbursts and sleep difficulties, as well as concentration difficulties and fatigue. The more severe your defensiveness, the more severe your anxiety, and the more quickly you go over the edge. Phobias and panic attacks. Those with, um, who are sensory defensive commonly experience phobias and panic attacks. For instance, glaring light, overstimulating eye contact, sudden touch, and other people's odors may overwhelm you to where you must disengage from social contact and you appear socially phobic. Space-related phobias occur as a result of faulty vestibular integration, again, balance issues, and you get easily destabilized from movement experiences like elevators, escalators, roller coasters, going fast or spinning, and you may begin to panic. If sensory defensiveness becomes severe, touch, Loud noises or bright lights alone will trigger panic. Okay. PTSD, severe sensory defensiveness is traumatizing and an overload can easily go over the edge into shutdown where you become numb and tune out the world. Consequently, you essentially live your life as in a state, as if in a state of PTSD. Conversely, those who have experienced trauma are hyper alert and commonly experience sensory overload. In other words, sensory defensiveness may result from, cause, or contribute to PTSD. Agoraphobia. Easily overloaded in public places, the moderate to severe sensory defensive can go over the edge from sensory overload and have a panic attack. To avoid another, you bury yourself in your home and appear agoraphobic, a serious disorder in which the person fears harm in open space away from the security of the home and a safe person. The sensory defensive can also become reclusive because home is the only place where they can reasonably control sensory input. Okay, obsessive compulsive disorder. Tactile defensiveness can make certain sensations on your hands like dirt, anything gooey or sticky bother you acutely and you may wash your hands constantly, wear gloves when preparing meals and obsess over getting dirty and psych psychologists diagnose you with OCD. You may also engage in rituals like repetitive rocking or counting as a distraction and also to lower your arousal level as, a repetition, as repetition boosts serotonin in the brain to regulate mood and balance neurochemistry. Ordering objects serves a similar purpose, a common compulsion for those on the autistic spectrum who are often neat freaks. And keeping things in order creates predictability that gives the defensive more control and influence over their immediate environment, clothes, food, and activities, so they can be more open to other issues. Substance abuse. To create a steady flow of pleasurable vibes and blunt, blunt feelings of tension, anxiety, and frustration, as well as to blunt the senses, 
The moderate to severe sensory defensive might develop an addiction to controlled substances like alcohol or tranquilizers. Mood disorders, depression, lonely, anxious, stressed, fatigue, unable to sleep or find comfort in cuddling, the sensory defensive becomes depressed easily. The extreme stress associated with sensory defensiveness also depletes serotonin, the mood-regulating neurotransmitter. Add to this a profound lack of control in your life that makes you despair of getting what you want, creating learned helplessness, and it's hard to not drag through life. The more severe the defensiveness, the more you feel out of control of your destiny and the deeper your depression. The restrictions you feel compelled to impose to avoid overstimulation also dampen mood. For instance, you might not like cloudy days because you are light sensitive. So you might stay home to avoid the you might stay home to avoid the overstimulation of crowds, noise, bright lights and people and feel alienated from others. And of course the big one, intimacy. If you are t if your tactile defenses, intimate contact may be uncomfortable, and this puts a wedge between you and close human connection. And that is, of course, profoundly depressing. Bipolar disorder two. Moderate to severe sensory defensiveness can mimic bipolar disorder two. Sensory overload causes impulsive frantic, aggressive, and even violent behavior, and you would appear manic. For instance, there are people, if you touch their shoulder, they'll whack you. When you cannot escape the overload, you shut down and appear depressed. At the severe level, especially, you vacillate from meltdown, which is mania, to shutdown, which is depression. A capacia suicide. If anxiety and tension become unrelenting and maddening, and you constantly want to jump out of your skin, a psychiatric condition called acathasia, some severely sensory defenses will attempt suicide. Acathasia happens also in response to drug withdrawal from antidepressants, and it has long been linked to suicide as the only means of ending the horrific bodily upheaval. Okay, eating disorders. Next slide, eating disorders. Okay, did we not, did something happen with eating disorders? All right, well, okay, don't, don't worry about that. Just leave it where it is. Okay, uh, anorexia. Moderate to severe oral defensiveness can be confused with anorexia. Teenagers will refuse to eat, not because they want to be thin necessarily, but because eating is an effort as many food textures feel irritating to the mouth and anorexic like starving gets misdiagnosed and mistreated as such. Okay, now personality disorders, avoidant personality. As sensory issues cause you to withdraw from social experiences and intimacy, you seem standoffish and might be labeled an avoidant personality. Borderline personality, which you know is a really serious condition. As sensory defensiveness intensifies, you may be misdiagnosed borderline from your marked shifts in mood, impulsive and unpredictable unpredictable behavior, and great difficulty in personal relationships, often transitory, along with self-destructive addictive behavior like, like substance abuse for self-calming. Obsessive personality, uh, compulsive personality, bombarded at every turn by sensations that you cannot control, you take extreme measures to self-calm. This can lead to compulsive activity like eating, shopping, sexual activity, and so forth, predisposing you to obsessive and compulsive behavior. The more severe the defensiveness, the more severe are the rituals and compulsive behavior. Disassociative disorders, depersonalization. When life inside your body becomes intolerable, you shut out the world and depersonalize, losing your sense of self is real. Dissociation. I've known some people with severe sensory defensiveness who actually have multiple personality disorder. Okay, um, next slide. Sensation seeking. Next slide. Okay, so now psychopathology is so associated, associated with sensation seeking and the languid person. Remember, this is the person who seeks passive sensation seeking. Generalized anxiety. Low responsiveness 
low responsiveness to sensation results in much missed information and the world often doesn't make sense. Low muscle tone goes hand in hand with poor fine motor coordination and clumsiness and you find it hard to get routine things done and you fatigue easily. As a result, you worry excessively about completing the day's tasks like shopping, cooking, getting dressed in the morning, getting your kids dressed, washed, and fed, and out the door, and so forth. Such worry and difficulty in making it through the day efficiently makes you feel easily st stressed and irritable, while at the same time, poor body awareness leaves you unaware of body signals indicating irritability, like rapid breathing and tense muscles. And by the way, that is your sense of interoception, your sense of knowing what's going inside your body, which is poor in the language. So consequently, tension escalates until you explode or collapse. See, phobias. Because of low muscle tone and vestibular dysfunction, again, balance problems, you feel uneasy in space, and you may experience space-related phobias like fear of heights or claustrophobia. And by the way, if anyone experiences space-related uh, fears like heights or claustrophobia, before you go to a psychiatrist and get put on medication, you need to check your balance system because there's probably an excellent chance that that's what's causing it. Okay, PTSD, the whole constellation of needing much sensation to tune into the world, of finding it hard to get your body moving, of feeling out of touch with your body, and of being unable to easily make sense of the world can be traumatizing to the point where some people experience PTSD. Mood disorders, depression. When you are hyper-responsive to sensation, it takes a huge power to get you engaged. And if you don't get it, you are at risk for depression. This risk is compounded by low muscle tone, which by making moving Effortful and not pleasurable results in exercising little, if at all. Um, hello? hello? I, do you hear me? Yes, we hear you. I'm having, okay, I'm having a problem hearing you. But so here's the thing, because there's a lot more in terms of going through the psychiatric problems associated with SPD. And so I think what it's probably best to do is to skip that. It's all in my book, Up Tight and Off Center. Um, and I think instead we're going to have to jump to treatment. Okay, so... Let's, and I'm going to have to just, I'll go through this very quickly. So we know, okay, with, with meds, we know that meds are, are not effective with SPD, but with, um, with ADHD. Okay, and one of the ways to know if you have SPD misdiagnosis, ADHD, is whether or not meds work. Okay, cognitive kind of behavioral therapy is used traditionally for uh, ADHD. Um, I'm getting all this, this sound. Am I coming through loud and clear to everyone? Just let me know, Susan. Is, is everything okay? Am I being heard all right? Yeah, yeah, all yes, right. We, can hear, we can hear you, but okay. there's a lot of background okay. noise. Okay. Okay, there's a lot of background sure. noise. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, Stuart, uh, SP Stuart, Stuart, if you're on, you can turn off your mic. That's a possibility. So. Thanks. Okay, so you, you do what you need to do to fix that, and let me just move right along. Uh, sensory processing disorder, and the, the classic therapy for that is sensory motor interventions, and they, they're, they're really very effective um, in, in helping people, especially children, with uh, sensory processing disorder. Okay, but here's the thing. Whether you have SPD or ADHD or both, the point is you have a disorganized nervous system. And so the way that I approach treatment is um, I attempt to fix the nervous system 
Because if the nervous system remains destabilized, you get limited results. And the only way to fix the nervous system is to take a holistic approach. And a huge one, the first one, is nutrition. And that's very big. Um, so if there's a glitch in the brain, then it makes good sense to fix that. You need to feed the brain nourishing fuel and avoid giving it food that destabilizes the brain. And that's very important as just about everyone Susan, are you there? I think we lost Sharon. I, I am here. I think we have to cancel this regretfully. Um, yes, we've, we've lost the speaker. So sorry, everyone. This was a really fascinating conversation. We'll try to reschedule at a time when we can um, can set up a better technical solution. This, one, this obviously has been difficult from the beginning. Thanks to all of you who tuned in. This was, doc, this was attempting to be Dr. Sharon Heller on sensory processing disorder and ADHD. We, we will be back in touch when we can reschedule. Thanks, everyone. Bye.